Hey guys, it's Gia here, and I'm going to be doing something a little bit different than I usually do, so I'm going to be reading Twilight out loud to you guys, because I love this book. And there's the cover right there for you, in case you all, like, I don't know, need to see the cover or something. I don't own the picture. I own the book, though. Um, so I will be reading the preface and chapter one, First Sight. Okay, so, yeah, there's, like, 24 chapters. So here's what, you see a quote on this first page, and so, here it is. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou shalt eat fist, Thor, if thou shalt surely die. Genesis 2.17. Well, that's pleasant. Preface, or preface, or however it's pronounced. I never given much thought to how I would die. Though I had reason enough in the last few months, but even if I had, I would not have imagined it like this. I stared without breathing across the long room into the dark eyes of the hunter, and he looked pleasantly back at me. Surely it was a good way to die in the place of someone else, someone I loved. No belief in. That ought to count for something. I knew that if I never go into Forks, I wouldn't be facing death right now. Terrified as I was, I couldn't bring it to myself to regret the decision. When life offers you a dream so far beyond any of your expectations, it's not reasonable to grieve when it comes to an end. The hunter smiled in a friendly way as he sauntered forth to kill me. Pleasant, much. Bravo, Bella. You really know how to read. So, first sight. Chapter one. Wait, chapter one, first sight. Okay. My mother drove me to the airport with the windows rolled down. It was 75 degrees in Phoenix. The sky a perfect, cloudless blue. I was wearing my favorite shirt. Sleeveless white eyelet lace. I was wearing it as a farewell gesture. My carry-on item was a parka. In the Olympic Peninsula of Northwest Washington State, a small town named Forks exists under a near constant cover of clouds. It rains on this inconsequential, uh, inconsequential town more than any other place in the United States of America. It was from this town and its gloomy, omnipresent shade that my mother escaped with me when I was only a few months old. It was in this town I had been compelled to spend a month every summer until I was 14. That was the year I finally put my foot down. These past three summers, my dad Charlie vacationed with me in California for two weeks instead. It was to Forks I now exiled myself, an action that I took with great horror. I detested Forks. I loved Phoenix. I loved the sun and the blistering heat. I loved the vigorous, sprawling city. Bella, my mother, said to me, the last of a thousand times before I got on the plane. You don't have to do this. I'm reading it to my fans. <sighs> my mom looked at me except my mom looks like me except with except with short hair and laugh lines. I felt a spasm of panic as I stared at her wide childlike eyes. How could I leave my loving, erratic, harebrained mother to fend for herself? Of course she had Phil now, so the bills would probably get paid. There'd be food in the fridge, gas in her card, someone to call when she was lost, but still. I want to go, I lied. I'd always been a bad liar, but I'd been saying this lie so frequently lately that it sounded almost convincing now. Tell Charlie I said hi. I will. I'll see you soon, she insisted. You come home whenever you want. I'll come right back as soon as you need me. But I could see the sacrifice in her eyes behind the promise. Don't worry about me, I urged. It'll be great. I love you, Mom. She hugged me tightly for a minute, and then I got on the plane, and she was gone. It was a four-hour flight. From Phoenix to Seattle, another hour in a small plane up to Port Angeles, and then an hour drive back down to Forks. Flying doesn't bother me. The hour in the car with Charlie, though, I was a little worried about. Charlie, it seemed, had been... Oh, I'm not going to start that over. Charlie had been fairly nice about the whole thing. He seemed genuinely pleased that I was coming to live with him for the first time with any degree of permanence. He had already gotten me registered for high school and was going to help me get a car. But it was sure to be awkward with Charlie. Neither of us knew, and would ne neither of us would anyone call him verbose. And I didn't know what there was to say. Regardless, I knew he was more than a little confused by my decision. Like my mother before me, I hadn't made a secret of my taste before. When I landed in Fort Angeles, it was raining. I didn't see it as an om omen, just unavoidable. I already said my goodbyes to the sun. Charlie was waiting for me with the cruiser. This I was expecting, too. Charlie's the police chief swan to the good people of Forks. My primary motivation behind buying a car, despite the scarce 
scarcity of my funds was that I refused to be driven around town in a car with red and blue lights on top. Nothing slows down traffic like a cop. Charlie gives me gave me an awkward one-armed hug when I stumbled my way off the plane. It's good to see you, Bells, he said, smiling, as he automatically caught and studied me. You haven't changed much. How's Renee? Renee. Mom's fine. It's good to see you too, Dad. I wasn't allowed to call him Charlie to his face. I only had a few bags. Most of my Arizona clothes were too permeable for Washington. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> my mom and I had pooled our resources to supplement my winter wardrobe, but it was still scanty. It all easily f it fit it all fit easily into the trunk of the cruiser. I found a good car for you, really cheap. He announced w when we were strapped. And what kind of car? I was suspicious the way he said, "Good car for you," as opposed to just "good car." Well, the truck actually a Chevy. Where did you find it? Do you remember Billy Black down at La Push? La Push is a is the tiny Indian reserve reservation on the coast. No, he used to go fishing with us during the summer. Charlie prompted. That would explain why I didn't remember him. I do a good job of blocking painful, unnecessary things from my memory. He's in a wheelchair now, Charlie continued, and I didn't respond, so he can't drive anymore, and he offered to sell me his truck cheap. What year is it? I could see from the change of expression that this was the question he had hoping I wouldn't ask. Well, Billy's done a lot of work on the engine. It's only a few years old, really. I hope you didn't think so little of me as to believe I would give up that easy. When did he buy it? He bought it in 1984, I think. Did he buy it new? Well, no. I think it was new in the early 60s, or late 50s at the earliest, he admitted sheepishly. Should Dad, I don't really know anything about cars. I wouldn't be able to fix it if anything went wrong, and I couldn't afford a mechanic. Relax, Bella. The thing runs great. They don't build them like that anymore. The thing, I thought to myself. It had possibilities as a nickname, at the very least. How cheap is cheap? After all, that was the part I couldn't com compromise on. Well, honey, I already bought it for you. As a homecoming gift, Charlie peeked sideways at me with a hopeful expression. Wow, free. You didn't need to do that, Dad. I was going to buy myself a car. I don't mind. I want you to be happy here. He he was looking ahead at the road when he said this. Charlie wasn't comfortable with expressing his emotions out loud. I inherited that from him. So I was looking straight ahead as I responded. That's really nice, Dad. Thanks. I really appreciate it. No need to add that my being happy in Forks is an impossibility. You didn't need to suffer along with me. And I never looked that free truck in the mouth or the engine. Well now, you're welcome, he mumbled, embarrassed by my thanks. We exchanged a few more comments on the weather, which was wet, and that was pretty much it for conversation. We stared out the window in silence. We, well, it was beautiful, of course. I couldn't deny that. Everything was green. The trees, their trunks covered with moss, their branches hanging with the canopy of it. The ground covered with ferns. Even the air filtered down greenly through the leaves. It was too green. An alien planet. Eventually, we made it to Charlie's. He still lived in the small two-bedroom house they bought with my mother in their early days of their marriage. Those were the only kind of days they, their marriage had. The early ones. There, parked on the street and from the new house that never changed was my new, well, new to me, truck. It was a faded red color with big brown fenders and a bulldozed cap. Cap, uh, ugh. To my intense surprise, I loved it. I didn't know if it would run, but I could see myself in it. Plus, it was one of those solid iron affairs that could never get damaged. The kind you see at a scene of an action, paint unscratched, surrounded by the pieces of the foreign car it had destroyed. Wow, Dad, I love it. Thanks. Now my horrific day tomorrow would be just less dreadful. I wouldn't be faced with the choice of walking two miles in the rain to school or accepting a ride in the chief's cruiser. I'm glad you like it, Charlie said gruffly, embarrassed again. It took only one ship to get all my stuff upstairs. I got the west bedroom that faced out over the yard. The room was familiar. It had belonged to me since I was born. The wooden floor, the light blue walls, the peak ceiling, the yellow lace curtains around the windows, these were all a part of my childhood. The only changes Charlie had ever made for me were switching the crib for a bed and adding a desk as I grew. The desk now held a second-hand computer with a phone line for the modern step staple with, with ugh. The desk now held a second-hand computer with the phone line for a modem stapled along the floor to the nearest phone jack. This was a stipulation from my mother so that we could stay in touch easily. The rocking chair from my baby days was still in the corner. Don't don't turn off on me, okay? <laughs> There was only one small bathroom at the top of the stairs, which I would not have to, which I would have to share with Charlie. I was trying not to dwell too much on the fact. 
One of the best things about Charlie is he doesn't hover. He left me alone to unpack and get settled, a feat that would have been altogether impossible for my mother. It was nice to be alone, not to have to smile and look pleased, a relief to stare de dejectedly out the window at the sheeting rain and let, a f and let just a few tears escape. I wasn't in the mood to go on a real crying jag. I would save that for bedtime when I would have to think about the coming morning. Forks High School had a frightening total of only 357, now 58, students. There were more than 700 people in my junior class alone back home. All of the kids here had grown up together. The grandparents had been toddlers together. I would be the new girl from the big city, a curiosity, a freak. Maybe if I looked like the girl from Phoenix should, I could work this to my advantage. Physically, I never fit in anywhere. I should be tan, sporty, blonde, a volleyball player, or a cheerleader, perhaps. All the things that go with living in the Valley of the Sun. It said I was ivory skinned without even the excuse of blue hair or red eyes, despite the constant sunshine. I'd always been slender, but soft somehow, obviously not an athlete. I didn't have the necessary hand eye coordination to play sports without humiliating myself and harming both myself and anyone else who stood too close. When I finished, Putting my clothes into the old pine dresser, I took my bag of bathroom necessities and went to the communal bathroom to clean myself up after the day of travel. I looked at my face in the mirror as I brushed through my tangled damp hair. Maybe it was a light, but I already looked shallow and unhealthy. My skin could be pretty. It was almost very clear, almost translucent looking. But it all depended on color. I had no color here. Facing my pallid expression in the mirror, I was forced to admit that I was lying to myself. It wasn't I'd physically never fit in. <laughs> If I couldn't find a niche in the school with 3,000 people, where were my chances here? I didn't relate well to people my age. Maybe the truth was I didn't relate to people, period. Even my mother, who I was closer than anyone else on the planet, was never in harmony with me, never on the exact same page. Sometimes I wondered if I was seeing the same things through my eyes that maybe the rest of the world was seeing through theirs. Maybe there was a glitch in my brain, but, but the cause didn't matter. All that mattered was the effect, and tomorrow would be just the beginning. So that was pages 1 through 10 in the quote preface thing. I really want to hear your support, and I'm sort of doing this So I'm for language arts. So yay, language arts, or LA, or English, whatever you call it, wherever you live. But anyways, thanks for watching, and if you hate Twilight, then why are you watching this? But anyways, thanks guys, and I will be posting later with another video of this.